Hi guys, so here's our second video that goes with the anatomy of the nervous system. Uh, we're really going to be focusing on some of the parts of the brain. We will not touch upon the cranial nerves in this video at all, guys. We'll get that in a separate one. Um, but we're going to talk about primarily the cerebrum in this video. So let's jump right into it. Okay. So a little background before we get into specifically the cerebrum. Okay. So we got the brain, right? 97% of the body's neural tissue. Okay. Uh, weighs around three pounds. Pretty. Um, doesn't seem very large considering how important it is, but uh, there we are. Uh, composed of three main regions. We've got our cerebrum, which is going to be our focus for tonight. And then you've got the cerebellum and brainstem, which we will focus on tomorrow evening. Um, and then there's sometimes people break this last portion, the diencephalon, into a fourth part. We're going to consider it as part of the brainstem. So we'll, you'll see that as part of the brainstem there. Okay. Uh, brown is the sorry. The brain is surrounded by the cranium, right? Uh, and then it's got the same meninges that we talked about around the spinal cord and the cerebral spinal fluid, which is the fluid that kind of covers everything around the cerebrum and the spinal uh, cord. Um, and that's going to help with cushioning. It's going to help with some protection from physical injury, uh, some of the chemical environment, uh, things along those lines. But you got that fluid around there. That's what people take out in the, when they take a spinal tap. They take out some of that fluid to look at it. And you can test for infections. Okay. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that along with all of that, there's something referred to as the blood-brain barrier. And it's a it's a barrier that helps um, with the blood vessels to kind of keep most chemicals from being able to diffuse into the nervous tissue. Uh, the neurons are super sensitive, and we want to keep them, and they're super important, so we kind of keep them isolated. So very few things actually get through the blood there. Um, all the things that we know of that are like drugs of abuse uh, or alcohol, things like that, those are exceptions that are able to get through that barrier. So here's what we're going to really focus on tonight. We're going to focus on the cerebrum, okay? And the, the two big parts that I want you to know is the largest part of the brain, okay? Um, but this is the most important part. Everything that we're consciously aware of happens in the cerebrum. So everything you touch that you are aware of, everything you smell, hear, taste, anything along those lines, anything you imagine or think about, that all happens in the cerebrum. Every voluntary movement, uh, the speech that I'm uh, make, uh, putting out right now, all of that happens because of this cerebrum. Okay, so um, super, super important. So here's, so here's some background anatomy that goes with it. So it's divided into right and left halves, okay, right and left halves, and it's divided what's along what's called the longitudinal fissure. We'll get to see that in our sheep brain dissection. Um, uh, each half is then referred to as a cerebral hemisphere, so that's one half of the cerebrum, the large part of your brain here. Okay? The surface of, the of each hemisphere is composed of gray matter, right? And gray matter, remember, um, is unmyelinated neurons. The word you should be thinking about every time you see gray matter in this unit is processing. Okay? So this gray matter is called the cerebral cortex. Remember, cortex is on the outside. It's like the, you know, this, root, this word actually means kind of bark. Um, so we'll see renal cortex. We've, uh, we've seen other pieces there. Um, but cerebral cortex is on the, around the outside, okay? and it's got lots of folds. Okay? The ridges on the surface are called giri here, and the grooves, the little indents, the valleys, are called sulci. Okay? Um, because of this folding, so there's a ton of folding on the surface of the brain, um, we get a huge amount of surface area. So your gray matter, this cerebral cortex, is only about a quarter of an inch thick. Um, and it turns out that if it's thicker than that, it actually slowed us, slow, slows down processing speed. It actually makes it more difficult for us to think and uh, respond to the world around us. So we can't make the cortex thicker, but we can fold it and squeeze more in there. And we'll talk about that more with the sheep dissection as well. All right, so a couple of big ideas, okay? Um, so each hemisphere receives sensory information from and sends motor commands to the opposite side of the body. We refer to this as contralateral. So I think most of you guys are aware of this, that if I touch something with my right hand, it actually gets sent to my left hemisphere. Um, if I want to move my right hand, that command comes from a left hemisphere. So they go opposite side, contra, opposite, lateral, side. Okay. Uh, the two hemispheres are also different in terms of their functions. Um, so there are some things that are on both sides, but there's a lot of things that are lateralized, so they only take place on one side. So this is an overgeneralization, but in most people, the left hemisphere is what referred to as the dominant hemisphere. It controls our reading and our writing and our math and our decision-making, our speech and language. Um, in most people, the left side is where we have more of our sensations of touch and taste and sight and things like that, recognition, uh, recognition of face and things like that, uh, the more artistic side of the brain. So a lot, a lot of people say like the logical side versus the artistic side of the brain. Okay? Um, and it varies from person to person, but that's pretty general. You'll see most people, the left hemisphere being the dom dominant hemisphere. 
So when we look at the actual cerebrum, and we'll show you a picture here in just a moment, um, everyone's brain, the surface is unique, but there's a few sulci that are fairly constant, and they help break the brain into its four main lobes, the frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital lobes um, that we've seen before. Okay? Uh, some sources also have this little uh, section called the insula, which is another lobe. Most people, uh, I prefer to consider as part of the temporal lobe, so we're going to leave it there. Um, and we're going to have it listed in there as the visceral association area. So this area is responsible for, so remember, viscera is hollow internal organs. Um, and so this is the part where, like, if you have an upset stomach or a full bladder, as I wrote down here, um, this is the part of the brain that would receive that information and allow you to recognize, hey, I really need to go to the bathroom, or wow, my stomach kind of hurt, and those types of things. So here's a nice picture of a, a human brain. Um, it's got some key labels here that we want to be aware of. So the first one that you have on here is called the central sulcus. And the central sulcus is this groove that goes right down here between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. Okay? Um, and the central sulcus really kind of goes down to here. And then there's another called the lateral sulcus that kind of dives in here. And they kind of meet at this angle. And we'll label these on our sheet brain. Uh, so you get a feel for those pretty soon. But you'll see how they kind of divide up the brain a little bit there. Okay? Um, kind of below and behind the frontal lobe, you have your temporal lobe. Okay, at the back you have your occipital lobe, and there's no real good dividing boundaries there. Um, this um, blood vessel right here is kind of what is often used as the dividing boundary um, between the uh, parietal lobe up here and your temporal lobe down here. Um, and then the rest of the parts of the brain, we've got our cerebellum, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. That's this whole portion hanging off the back here, and then all this is what you can see of the brainstem. Most of the brainstem is buried deep inside there. So if we just focus on the cerebrum, so this picture is taking out the cerebellum, which would have been back here, and the brainstem that would have come down this way. Um, so we're just looking at the cerebrum, and the cerebrum, you'll notice, is all these different colors. It's divided into functional areas. So there are areas that are um, devoted just to vision. Um, there are areas devoted just to hearing. There are areas devoted to just smell, and so forth. Areas that this primary motor area here, this is what all of your voluntary movements start from there. The, they, if we're wiggling my hands or writing on this board right now, come, originally comes from this primary motor area. So your brain's divided into these different areas, and not all of them could fit in this picture, so there's actually a second picture that looks like this, where there's a couple more uh, really important areas, this prefrontal cortex and the general interpretation area and Broca's area and frontal eye field, they're in that diagram there. So I took these two visuals and then broke them down on two pages of slides that look like this. So these are the functional areas of the cerebral cortex. So that's really important. I would kind of mark that so you can, I'm going to use that phrase and I want to make sure you know what I'm talking about. And you're definitely going to need time to, stand, uh, to study these and really know these come time for our exam. We're going to have a bunch of assignments that, that use them to help you learn them along the way. But um, basic breakdown, uh, most of them are pretty straightforward. The primary motor okay, is responsible for all voluntary movements. So when we move our skeletal muscles, it comes from the primary motor. Okay? This premotor is kind of like your muscle memory area. It's all the learned movements, so all the things you've done before. Motor writing, all the fine movements of your hands, not just writing, but sewing or buttoning a shirt, things like that. Um, the prefrontal cortex is probably the most important part there. Um, the prefrontal cortex is what really separates it from the other animals. It's our um, imagination, our problem solving. All of those things happen in the prefrontal cortex. It's what makes us more advanced than the other animals, is that prefrontal cortex. Okay? Gustatory for taste, frontal eye field moves the eyes, Broca's area moves your mouth for speech. Okay? So that's the list for the frontal lobe. Then you go down to the parietal lobe, and the parietal lobe has a primary sensory, and that's where we're going to receive all the somatic sensory stuff. So touch, pain, uh, pressure, vibration, temperature, not sight, sound, things like that. Those all have special areas. Um, and then there's an area called the somatic sensory, which just kind of makes sense of the information. So once information comes in, you can process it and recognize, all right, well, I've had that kind of pain before. That's not a big deal. Or, wow, that hurts more than I've ever had. Um, so there's kind of a processing area inside there. On the next slide, you have the areas that are found in the temporal lobe. We already talked a little bit about the insula. You've got a smell area and two different auditory areas. The first one just receives auditory information, and the second one processes it. In the occipital lobe, you've got your visual area receives the information, like the size, shape, color. And then the visual association area kind of makes sense of it afterwards. 
Um, and then these areas down here, I put other areas, and they're, they're not in, contained in one lobe. So you've got the general interpretation area, another huge important area. It's often called the general knowledge area. Makes it sound kind of important there. Um, so this is where most of your memory is stored. Your factual knowledge of the world is stored in this area. Okay? And then the, within there, this Wernicke speech area, and this W is pronounced like a V. Um, uh, so the Wernicke speech area. Um, is the area that allows us to understand speech, understand spoken language, uh, written language, even a little bit of like facial expressions and things like that are in here. So everything you would uh, associate with like understanding speech and processing speech takes place in there. So it's a really important area for us as well. Here's a little diagram kind of showing you a couple of the key features. So you got this corpus callosum that connects the two hemispheres. So this is from the top. You've got our our left and our right hemispheres. Um, and again, this is just kind of showing you how the signals can go from one side of the brain to the other and showing you kind of the, um, the, uh, math, the, the basic layout where we've got that lateralization where the left side of the brain tends to be more of our um, math and science and things like that. And then the right side tends to be a little bit more of an arts-focused uh, side of the brain. Here is a sagittal section, so sagittal section, um, the, showing some of those same pieces. So here's that corpus callosum that connects the two hemispheres, and you can see the occipital lobe and things like that. Um, this will be a particularly useful slide when we do our sheet brain dissection, because we'll be labeling all of these pieces in there. Um, and we'll kind of get into the details of like the cerebellum and the pons and all these pieces as we go through. Uh, the only thing I'd like to add in at this point, why we're, why we're there, is we have medulla here, that's the bottom part of our brain stem, which is going to be right, right here at the base. Okay, then you got this whole section here, which is the pons. I'd like to add in here these two additional words here. So this portion right above the pons, this whole area that I'm going to color in green, um, this is where we'd find the midbrain. And then this whole top portion here, which we'll kind of highlight as red here, is the diencephalon, and that's going to contain the thalamus and the hypothalamus. But uh, those aren't labeled on that picture, and I wanted to make sure you guys had those going forward. So add those in, midbrain and diencephalon, to your diagram. So then the very last thing we want to kind of tackle here is if we look at this section, this cross-section of the brain here, um, I want to point out a couple things. You can see the gray matter around the outside. That's the cerebral cortex where there's processing. Inside of it is white matter. Remember, white matter is getting myelinated, so there's a highway. So if I decide to move my toe and it's coming, that signal's starting, say, right up here is where that signal's starting, it would fly through this white matter, okay? But then you've got these chunks that are kind of colored in here. See these um, kind of pink and purple colors here? Those are sections that are referred to as the basal nuclei or the basal ganglia. I like ganglia. That's what I was taught. Um, and what they are is they're little spots that process the signals before they go on. So if I'm going to move my toes, it starts in the cortex, goes through this white matter, and then goes through these little chunks of gray matter here before being sent on down the brain stem and down the spinal cord and eventually out the nerves that go into my leg. Um, and these little, these gray matter are really important in kind of processing and adjusting the signals before they go out. Okay? Uh, when you see problems with the basal ganglia, that's what you, um, if you've ever seen Parkinson's disease, um, that's a condition where um, the basal ganglia are not functioning properly and you start to lose motor control of the body. So it's a very, very um, vivid um, image of what happens without the basal ganglia being fully functional. Okay. So that's what we're going to wrap up. Uh, where we're going to wrap up for the evening. That's our introduction to the brain as a whole and the uh, focus on the cerebrum. Um, as always, make sure you've marked stuff and ask questions tomorrow in class. Um, and I'll see you in class.